All right, I am privileged to introduce our day chair today. Greg Backstrom is our day chair. Greg grew up on a small farm in Wisconsin, and he got his BS in geology from the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire and his MBA from the University of St. Thomas. As a young adult, he served six years in the US Army Reserves as a combat medic. Uh, Greg spent the majority of his professional career working in engineering and environmental services, mostly for manufacturing, mining, and oil and gas clients. Uh, at present, he's doing some marketing and strategy consulting while he prepares to slide into retirement again. Uh, he's tried to retire three times and, and has failed each of those times. Um, he's an active on a number of boards and committees related to STEM education and economic empowerment. For fun, he likes to attend Twins games, camp, ski, sail, uh, travel, and cook. He's the proud father of two adult children. His daughter, Anna, uh, 26, uh, just completed her master's degree in public service at the U of M. And his son, Billy, 23, is finishing his bachelor's degree in food and ag business management, also at the University of Minnesota. Greg lives in East Harriet uh, in South Minneapolis. I have said this before, he lives on the most interesting block in the city. Uh, we've had a lot of great guests that Greg has brought with him and good speakers from his block too. So Greg, thank you so much for being our day chair today. Thank you, good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to announce our speaker, uh, Lisa Schlosser of Technovation Minnesota. Lisa believes that technology is critical to our existence, and she wants to ensure that the future is made up of diverse teams building the technology that will keep us safe, healthy, and happy. After seeing that song, I kind of question the benefits of technology. Um, she is currently living this vision through Technovation Minnesota, a not-for-profit organization that inspires and empowers girls to build technology to make a positive impact on our communities. Um, this introduction was obviously written by Lisa. What she didn't tell us was the really cool stuff. So uh, like a true 21st century person, I went to LinkedIn and found the real thing. So she's um, uh, got a BA from uh, St. Mary's University in mathematics. Her skills are big data, cloud computing, enterprise software, software development, and agile project management. So basically, she knows everything about things that I know nothing about. So I'm looking forward to her talk. Um, we're also connected. We have some mutual friends. Uh, Matt Kuharski with Padilla Spear is a mutual friend. And so I'm interested to learn uh, from her about what she uh, knows about Matt or how they know each other. And uh, she also did a first pitch at a Twins game in 2016. And from that, I learned that one of her goals in life is to see games at all 30 major league ballparks, which I have done. So Lisa, I will share um, some hints with you about that. So uh, please welcome our speaker, Lisa Schlosser. Great. So happy to be here. I'm so happy to, and excited to see people. I debated with the weather this morning. Should I just call in? And it's like, no, no, I actually get to see people. I'm, I'm going in. So I'm really excited to talk to you today about uh, diversity driving innovation and empowering women in technology. Now I have some slides. Are they coming? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and just for the record, oh no. Yeah, let's let's flip to the next one. Um, thank you very much, Greg, for the introduction. Uh, I am a female in technology, and I started my my career in computer programming, working. Um, as a programmer and up to leadership positions at Thomson Reuters over a 30 plus year career. Um, I am semi-retired. Um, so if anybody has troubles retiring, I'm, I'm all for helping them how to do that. <laughs> I'm, but I still really want to give back my time treasures and talents um, to the community. So I'm very involved in, in looking for opportunities to, to uh, uh, volunteer. Uh, I also have a goal. So I, I, I have all these goals, right? So I also have a goal to visit all the state parks in Minnesota. 
And so I think I'm on like 25 or so. So I've been having a lot of fun seeing places in Minnesota that I haven't been before when I've lived here my whole life. Um, if we flip to the next slide, um, there are only two more days in March to celebrate Women's History Month. So happy Women's History Month. My hope is that every day though, that you're working to raise women into leadership roles as we all benefit from when our, if our workforce is diverse. We'll talk definitely more about that today. I also love data as Greg mentioned. So we'll level set and, and talk about data to, to set our thinking. And we'll look at a couple of examples of why diverse teams matter and wrap up with some practical things that we can all do to make our home and work environments more diverse inclusive and equitable. So how do you introduce yourself? Let's go to the next slide. And here you're gonna to have to click a few times. Um, uh, how do you introduce yourself? It really depends on the context, right? So at a work event, I might use my previous job. I was CTO of Fine Law at Thomson Reuters or a volunteer at Technovation Minnesota. Um, as a female technologist, um, I might wanna make sure someone knows that I'm on a steering committee for women in tech. Um, if it's a family event, you can, you can keep clicking. If it's a family event, I might need to use that. I'm a daughter of Marie and Gerard, or I've been married for 30 years, or I'm Joe's mom. I'm Joe's mom at the baseball games a lot. Um, I'm passionate about the organizations that I volunteer for, and I might want to make sure that it's known that I'm on the board of trustees for the Science Museum, or I like to volunteer, so I volunteered for the Super Bowl and the Final Four. I'm a huge sports fan, so March Madness, if you want to find me, I am sitting in front of my TV, TVs, <laughs> multiple TVs, watching all the games, really enjoying it. The truth is that I'm all of these things, and whether or not they're important um, to the context, they are always what makes me, me. So next slide, who you are affects what you bring. Let's, one more time. So. The theory of intersectionality recognizes that a person is categorized and discriminated against by a variety of factors, including gender, race, age, education, religion, and many more. The overlap of interdependence of those categorizations is such that, for example, bias against a white woman is different than bias against a black woman. The term intersectionality was first coined in 1989 by American civil rights advocate, Kimberly Crenshaw. Intersectionality matters because it helps create a framework that allows organizations to see the larger pattern of individual experiences. Without these larger patterns, organizations often fail to recognize the compounding effect unconscious bias has on women. The term can be controversial, and while it may not be a perfect term, recognizing its uses and limitations helps to ensure that we don't overlook the challenges faced by people who belong to multiple marginalized groups. So next slide, uh, McKinsey and Company does a yearly report on women in the workplace and it first started in 2016. This data is from the September 2021 report. What you see in this chart is representation in the corporate pipeline across all industries. In engineering, the numbers are far worse than what you see here. Ah, there. Um, so in this chart, you see that women hold 48% of entry level jobs and 41% of manager roles across industries. In tech, these numbers are much worse. Women hold only 34% of entry-level engineering jobs and just 26% of entry-level manager jobs. Oops, went too far. There we go. In the first six years of this survey, attrition did not explain underrepresentation of women. So women and men were traditionally leaving their companies at similar rates and they had similar intentions to remain in the workforce. So if it's not attrition, what's driving the lower representation of women at each level? The two biggest drivers of representation are hiring and promotions, and companies are disadvantaging women in these areas from the beginning. Women are promoted to manager at far lower rates than men, and this makes it nearly impossible for companies to lay a, a foundation for sustained progress at more senior levels. For every 100 men promoted to manager, only 86 women overall were promoted, and in tech, that number is 52. So 186, 52 in tech. 
The representation of women is only part of the story. The pandemic continues to take toll on employees, especially women. Four in 10 women have considered leaving their company or switching jobs. Women of color continue to lose ground at every step in the pipeline. Between the entry level and C-suite, the representation of women of color drops off more than 75%. As a result, women of color account for only 4% of C-suite leaders, a number that has not moved significantly in the past three years. The change from 2006, though, is encouraging, um, especially at the highest levels. So between 2016 and 2021, the share of women it grew 14% in senior vice president roles and 27% at the C-suite. So this is good progress and much effort has been done in this area. But if companies continue to hire and promote women to manager at current rates, the number of women in management will reach parity in 12 years. I've been waiting um, a lot longer than 12 years. Oops. Okay, it's, it's, yeah, can you just put a back one? There you go, there, right there. <laughs> um, okay, so here you can see more detail on the representation of women in companies. Most of us would recognize as top technology companies. So the blue bars show the average representation of women in tech based on the anitab.org top companies data from 2017. Now this data is getting a little old, but I, I like it because it actually gives you individual information on each company. Um, and the, the top company award also uh, standardizes and creates guidelines around what's a tech job, because that can be very controversial too. And so there's, there's a lot of consistency in the data. So I like using this data. It was calculated based on 63 participating companies representing over half a million technologists. So it's a good representative sample as well. And then it's also across a number of different industries. So it's, it's in, in, inclusive that way. So I don't have the detailed use, um, de the detailed data used for the top company 2021 award. Um, however, there are many aggregated uh, metrics in the 2021 report, if you want to check that out at anitab.org. Um, the average that in the 2021 average is 26.7% women in technology roles. So in absence of that, the red marks that you see on there, I tried to just go out to a number of companies and just see what do they, what do they report as their women in technology roles. And those are, those are what you see in red. Now keep in mind again, um, there's not a lot of consistency in what's a tech role across these. So it's just, what does the company report? And so you can see um, the part I like about it is, you know, consistency aside, it's actually showing that there is some improvement across a lot of these companies. So, um, you know, things to think about, where does your company fall on this chart? Will anyone, um, or, or where does your company fall on this chart? Um, anybody at a company that wants to share? No, that's okay. All right, so if we go to the next one. Um, there, um, another way to look at representation, we often hear that companies have a goal to mirror the businesses and people that they serve. So how close are businesses to that goal? So for, I worked at Thomson Reuters for many years and like many of your businesses, you know, it may be hard to, to um, identify that number because of the B2B nature of, it's hard to, hard to um, identify the user of the, of the products that you create. Um, it's just a bit more complicated, but some of our best renowned tech companies, um, we can do that with pretty easily. So um, here I've, I've uh, highlighted LinkedIn, Facebook, and Pinterest. So let's start with LinkedIn. LinkedIn is saying that they have 25% of their technology staff is women. What do you think their user base is? User base of women, any, throw out a number? 70? It is, Let's see if this works. Oh, there you go. Oh, now I just ruined it. Okay, so yeah. So there, it's 43% for women. So then I was gonna ask you, um, user base for Facebook is 44. 
So again, companies say they're trying to mirror their customers. We have a couple examples here. We're not even close. Um, how about Pinterest? Pinterest is used by a lot of women, right? They, they, they claim they have 50% of their staff as women. What do you think their user base of women is? <laughs> 99, 70%. All right, let's let's click that one and is 77%. So close guess. So even these even these uh, high tech companies, they're not they're not really close to mirroring mirroring their their user base. Um, okay, okay, that's what I'm doing. I'm just too fast. Yeah. We need to do tech, tech, tech. Oh. All right. So I, I, I really wanted to have another chart that looked kind of like the previous one where we took all of the individual companies and showed uh, their breakdown of tech employees by race. Um, and I couldn't find one, but I did find this one that aggregates the data. So this chart shows aggregated, aggregated data across 35 of the largest US-based tech companies. Not a single company has more than 12% black employees. 67% of companies have fewer than 5% employ, black employees. And 89% of companies have fewer than 8% black employees. A typical STEM worker now earns considerably more than a non-STEM worker. These differences are a lost opportunity in economic prosperity and contribute to the disparity of under, underrepresented groups in our communities. We have an opportunity to greatly increase the technology pipeline and economic growth of the communities where we live by harvesting this underutilized group of people. So where is Minnesota position? All right, can we go to the next one? A darn technology. Let's go one more. One more. So Minnesota, um, leaders shape our institutions and influence culture, people, and communities. You guys are all leaders here. So how do our leaders reflect Minnesota's diversity? Minnesota Compass and the Bush Foundation teamed up to answer this question. If you haven't perused the Minnesota Compass site, I highly encourage you to do so. They do a great job and they have tons and tons of data um, across Minnesota on all different kinds of topics. So check it out. So while 51% of Minnesota adults are women, only 25% of leaders across Minnesota are women. Across sectors, women are far more prevalent in nonprofit and government than in business leadership. And when women do lead the, in the business sector, they tend to lead smaller businesses. We can go to the next slide. Real-time talent um, also has some really valuable data with regard to the job market in Minnesota. Here you see the IT forecast for the metro area. The Twin Cities metro area's population is getting older, that me included. Uh, we are not producing enough talent using our existing methods to meet the demand. Our unemployment is low and our growth rate, uh, you see here uh, of 0.9% is very conservative. As of Q1 2022, so this, this quarter, there are only about five potential candidates per tech posting. A typical tech posting is open for an average of 63 days. Non-Hispanic Latino make up 97.5% of technical jobs and men occupy 78.2% of technical jobs in Minnesota. So women at 21.8. IT needs to think differently about recruiting new talent. Past methods will not make up for the deficit that will happen in the workplace with the aging population. We also need to think carefully about the educational requirements these jobs um, require as institutions are not producing students with bachelor's degrees at a pace that will meet the demand. In Minnesota, the commissioner of D believes that 75% of Minnesota's labor growth over the next 25 years will come from people of color, meaning industries that are slow to become more diverse will be left behind. So if we go to the next slide, pandemic or not, our challenges in IT have not changed. We have a high labor shortage. There's a talent misalignment. The education requirements do not match our local talent needs. We need to upskill Minnesotans to keep pace with the workforce needs. Our educational disparities are extreme. You cannot read the news in Minnesota without seeing this discussed. We need to address this gap. 
And this is untapped potential to meet the needs of our forecasted business. So one of the things we go to the next slide that I'm doing is to improve diversity is working to inspire girls in Minnesota to pursue STEM through my work at Technovation Minnesota. So if we go to the next slide and run the video. You just click on it. Just click on the image. It'll take you out. So that works. Okay. Okay. So this is just a short video that gives you a. a Activation Minnesota inspires and empowers team girls to dream up, design, code, and pitch apps. Working with professional mentors, all girl teams develop a real world combination of technical and entrepreneurial skills. Teams of girls are tasked with creating an app to solve a real world problem they have identified in their community. Once their app is created, the girls then present their app at Appapalooza. Through these presentations, the girls are able to find their voice and offer their unique perspective to challenging problems. No matter what you're interested in, if it's art, math, science, English, all of those can connect to technology and you can use those in the world. We are Technovation Minnesota. We want to spark a fire within her. We want her to see that technology is simply a tool to get her ideas out to the world and that she can make the world more beautiful healthier, safer, and even more peaceful. We want her to know that there is a community that will support her and that the world is in dire need of her voice, her thinking, her innovations. They are waiting for her. If you can bring me back to the side. So um, data shows that Minnesota is dead last out of all the states and percent of high schools offering computer science. When Minnesota spend, or when students spend at least an hour a week studying computer science, they're more likely to see the importance of learning computer science, yet we aren't able to provide that to them. In Minnesota, we see a declining trend in high school graduates who are interested in STEM, but we are not a lost cause. So that's Minnesota down there at the very bottom. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, so I, I work with Technovation Minnesota, and it's a program of Code Savvy is our, is our parent organization, which also includes code camps and clubs and the Minnesota Codes or Minnesota Codes Educator Program, which is helping teachers inspire equitable computer science. Technovation Minnesota is the largest of the Code Savvy programs. Um, and it, we inspire and empower girls to build technology to solve challenges in their communities. We provide free curriculum, everything's free mentor guidance, educational resources, and encouragement for girls ages 10 to 18. The program parallels the school calendar, so we're kind of towards the end of our season now. The girls build a mobile app or an Alexa skill, and our challenges benefit beginner to advanced programmers, uh, computer science students, with the development of business cases and pitches, so we're technology and entrepreneurship. And we've attracted and successfully engaged girls at all levels of interest in STEM. We end our season with a huge event called Applepalooza in May. And everyone here is welcome. It's free um, and open to the public. And you get to watch the girls, as you saw, they get pretty excited about their pitches and, and their, um, their awards. We operate primarily in the Twin Cities and the Southwest Minnesota. Um, but with the pandemic, we've gotten very good at virtual team um, work. We go to the next slide. Um, the continued trend for companies is to want to take on more meaningful relationships with their nonprofit organizations they work with. So funding is, current, is certainly a key aspect for nonprofits to obtain their mission, but having an engaged and supportive community is just as critical. Technovation Minnesota has partnered with local companies to provide some amazing opportunities for girls in Minnesota. The Cargill Women and in Information Technology ERG Group um, and the U.S. Bank executives partnered with us to open their offices and senior leadership to host the girls with the focus of pitching live in their boardrooms. 
So, um, so prior to the pandemic, U.S. Bank has been doing this with, with us for six years now. They invite the girls to the office, and the girls literally pitch in the boardroom to Andy and the rest of the exec, senior executives at U.S. Bank. It's pretty cool. Um, the businesses get to share their inclusive culture and inspire these girls to have confidence that the future of technology needs their ideas and innovations and that there's a supportive community waiting for them. We're now working with Thomson Reuters to build a new tech track specifically targeted towards schools with high percentages of students of color. Their employees will serve as, or the Thomson Reuters employees will serve as mentors. We've built a pilot curriculum that will be easy to introduce to students who may not have the capacity to manage an after school effort. This curriculum will also be leveraged for in-class instruction as one of the pieces of feedback we hear is that we love it for the girls, but the boys need just as much inspiration. So these examples just show a few ways that businesses are building deeper and more custom relationships with organizations, how they're getting their employees and businesses engaged in the process. We go to the next slide. Um, we are making a difference and there's some wonderful quotes here, but I'll, I'll just pick out one. Um, Technovation did not prepare me to be a technologist, but any ologist. And we're seeing that a lot with our girls. Like I, coming from computer science, I would love if every single girl wanted to become a computer science programmer, but I'm also happy if they um, develop financial, uh, marketing, sales, uh, running a business skills, um, but have that technology background and we're doing that as well. And, um, and the next slide, uh, there are always ways to help. Uh, we, we have mentors. Um, we are primarily a volunteer organization. So we have committees that where most of our work is done. Um, board members, donations um, of anything. My biggest ask, I guess, would be just getting your girls involved, whoever your girls are. So if they're neighbors or friends or nieces or daughters or grandchildren or, you know, whatever it might be, um, you know, we'd, we'd love to have them try our, our organization. Um, on the next slide, uh, I won't run this video, but um, assuming that the slides may be available, I highly encourage you to click on the link and watch a pitch. They are incredibly creative and, um, and innovative in the ideas they come up with to use technology to solve problems in the community and the way they present them. So if we go to the, the next slide, let's get back to intersectionality. So intersectionality gives us a framework to talk about inequalities and bias in an effort to change, but what if we thought about it differently for the next few minutes? Next slide. What if we thought about it in terms of these differences helping us to innovate, to generate better ideas and build new products and services to help all people? Next slide. So diversity and inclusion aids in design. So here's just a couple examples if we go to the next slide. Um, OXO is a company that started when founder Sam Farber and his wife Betsy took a cooking class. Betsy was having a difficulty using a metal potato peeler and knew there had to be a better tool. She had arthritis and the metal hurt her hands. Betsy helped with early prototypes and helped shape the framework upon which the company was built, which was inclusive design. Inclusive, inclusive design is about maximizing the market potential of your products by making sure that the maximum number of people can use them. In inclusive design, the single most important component in the system is the user. It's not about designing for the disabled or the elderly. It's about pushing the boundaries of design. It's designing for the wildest possible range of users. It's about removing unnecessary obstacles in everyday life, making life better and easier for everyone. Because of early formation of this company focused on inclusive design, the price of the product was kept low and the product did not become a niche product, so only for those with arthritis. Diversity of teams bringing their abilities and disabilities can mean creation of products that benefit everyone. Most companies aren't taking enough action to address these problems. Only about 25% of employees say their company prioritizes disability and its DEI efforts. And that is my potato peeler. So I did, I, did, I did not know that when I bought it, but that was my favorite potato peeler. And when I found this example, I was like, I totally get it. Like, I understand why. If we go to the next slide, um, Joy, Joy Bolamwini is the founder of Elder, Elder, Algorithmic Justice League. 
an organization that claims to challenge the biases in decision-making software. When Joy was a computer science graduate at MIT, she was working on, a, on social robotics. So that's robotics that use computer vision to detect the humans that they're interfacing with. The, robotic, the robot was having a hard time recognizing her over her lighter skinned colleagues. At the time she thought, oh, this is a one-off thing. People will fix this. So later she was in Hong Kong for an entrepreneur event where she tried out another social robot and ran into the same problems. In both examples, the open source code was was used for the same open source code was used for face detection. So she started to get a sense that unconscious bias might feed in the technology that we create, but again, assume someone would fix it. It was only when it happened five years later that she discovered that wearing a white mask worked better than using her actual face. So it, the story is pretty funny. Um, funny, uh, yeah, but she she was uh, at her desk and it was happened to be Halloween and she just grabbed this sort of phantom of the opera mask and put it up to her face and voila, the software worked. So that's when she decided she needed to do something about it. The difficulty in facial recognition software seeing her face begins with the facial recognition community where benchmark data sets are meant to show the performance of various algorithms so you can compare them. There's an assumption that if you do well in the benchmarks then you're doing well overall, but no one was questioning the representative representativeness of the data. It seems incredible that, that the people putting together these benchmarks didn't realize how undiverse they were. Collecting data, particularly the diverse data is not an easy thing. It seems likely that a diverse team would have discovered this issue much sooner in the process. Joy's working to highlight bias and provide tools to mitigate bias. Think about the rise in automation and increased reliance on algorithms um, for many decisions, such as whether someone gets insurance, the likelihood for you to default on a loan, what schools your children are admitted to, or whether or not you're chosen for a job interview. It's important that these algorithms remove sign of bias, and won't that be more likely if the teams working on these algorithms are diverse? If we go to the next slide, if you want to test yourself, and see how ingrained your biases might be, try the implicit association test. Has anybody done it? It's, it, so here's how it works. There are four categories, female, male, home, and career, and there's words associated with that. And you take the test in two parts. The first part is it associates female and family words and male and career words. And then the second part, it associates female and career words and male and family words. And so when you take the test, you're, you're basically kind of clicking left or right when you see a word pop up, pop up, and you gotta put them in those pairs. So if we go to the next one, um, and I encourage you to try this yourself. When I took this, I was really upset at my results. I had a strong automatic association for male career and female family. And I thought that cannot be right. So I did it again. And I think I did it like five times. And every time I did it, it, it turned up the same way. And I thought, how is that possible? I am a female in technology. Um, my husband and I share most of the chores around the house. He's the guy that took the kids to the doctor and helps them with the homework. Um, like it, it just seemed like everything about me um, just wouldn't automatically do that. But yet that's what my results showed. These automatic preferences don't just engage our minds, they also impact on behavior such as influencing the career path we choose. And thankfully, my automatic preferences must have been out of whack because I decided that I love math and that I had to do something with math and computers when I graduated. So can we use our reflective analytical minds to devise techniques that will allow us to override unintended results of our automatic re reflexive pattern of thought? Not to be so discouraged, one thing being discovered that the younger test takers um, are, they have weaker automated biases. They're being trained in ways that I was not. Maybe I can feel good about the fact that uh, a part of training and be, is being a female in technology and showing my, my, the people I'm around um, that that's um, a very acceptable role. Um, and then my work with Technovation Minnesota. So I'm hoping we continue to change that, those biases. So where do we begin? Go to the next slide. 
How do you begin building these diverse teams? We saw the representation of women in corporate pipeline and talked about how recruiting is critical to success as you move through the pipeline. We also talked about how the fact that women are promoted far less than men. If you hire and advance women, you also have to have an environment that helps retain them. You need all three of those pieces or you get a leaky pipeline. So if we go to the next slide. We learned earlier that promotion is one aspect that affects women along the pipeline. Three enablers that have helped companies repair the broken rung on the career ladder for women in technical roles are skills, support, and structure. For skills, companies need to provide equitable access to skill building, formal skills development beyond technical training, offering resources such as um, how to prioritize career development or how to be effective in promotional interviews is equally important. It's also important for women in technical roles to join high visible projects where they can develop their skills on the job. For support, matching programs that pair women with sponsors as well as networking groups have been successful. Sponsors provide seniority, power, influence um, uh, to help those uh, women that they're sponsoring. For structure, companies that invest heavily in highly structured, clear, and transparent systems with well-defined skills criteria for each role and each level had less of a broken rung. In the top companies, early tenure promotions are decided by committee rather than individuals and bias checks are integrated into the process. Direct managers often play an especially important role in professional lives of early tenure employees, yet many managers of junior tech employees have little management training or experience themselves. Even with good intentions, they can create uneven experiences for early tenure workers, leading companies um, invest in the development of managers at lower levels. Are we running out of time? Okay. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, measurement is um, one of the most important things. So nearly all companies in the McKinsey company and company study tracked representation by gender and race, but only 60% um, set numerical goals and only 35% track differences in promotion rates. We need to measure. Next slide. Every day we have an opportunity to create a more inclusive workplace, making our workplace better for everyone, not just underrepresented groups. More diverse teams can ensure, not guarantee, but bring us closer to the end goal. We're building algorithms that are not biased. We're building products that are safe and products and services that, that will make the world a better place. Every day, we have an opportunity to enforce team dynamics that encourage social sensitivity and equal time for all voices. Isn't it worth building diversity in our workplace to ensure we have the best opportunity to delight our customers and keep them safe, healthy, ha happy, and productive? Programs and policies designed to reduce bias and ensure fairness don't just benefit women, they benefit everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Sorry about giving you the hook. Will you have time to stay afterwards for questions? Okay, so uh, thank you. What a fascinating uh, a presentation. Um, we have a couple things for you. So first off, we have a book uh, that we'd like you to sign. It will be donated to Way to Grow to help improve literacy. So this will be given to a third grader to uh, by a leader in our community. So um, it's very important that we uh, practice literacy and we, we try to do that as well. Um, and then we also have for you a bookmark that was made by a group in uh, Haiti. Uh, and we have these uh, prepared. So you have a, a commemorative thing from, from our organization. So again, thank you very much. So please feel free to stick around and chat with her if you'd like. Um, turning the mic back over to Scott, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Greg, for being our day chair today. Ellen, great song. Thank you so much for the song. Uh, Dan Cadet, thank you for being our greeter today. Uh, and of course, Brock and Ross, thank you. Oh, and Greg. Greg, thank you, all three of you, for uh, your technologically technological wizardry here today. Uh, and Mary Pat, thank you for uh, being our administrator. Next week, you aren't going to want to miss Addie Cross, our global grant uh, scholarship recipient, will be with us in person, not beaming in from some distant land. She'll be here right with us. So you're going to want to be here next week. Until then, though, have a great Rotary Week. <laughs>